All right, let's call this meeting to order. I want to welcome everybody to the April 7th, 2014 um, St. Louis Park School Board Study Session. Thank you all for coming on a lovely spring night, and I say that with all seriousness. It's spring and you're here, so thank you. We're going to start our meeting tonight with our spotlight, and one of the things we're going to talk about at the spotlight, in fact, the only thing we're going to talk about at the spotlight, is our bird feeder program. It is one of the most exciting things I've heard about. I'm just so proud of every one of you who's been involved in the bird feeder program. And uh, for those at home, because we play on cable, so our community is going to hear about this, and that's part of what we want. We want to celebrate you. We want our community to know what's happening here, um, because it's just wonderful. And so I'm going to call on Sophia Ross and Jenna Benkin to tell us all about the bird feeder program. Well, hello, and thank you for having us, the bird feeder. My name is Sophia Ross. I'm the community service teacher here at St. Louis Park High School. And this is Jenna Banken. And Jenna Banken applied to be the school, or school store, the bird feeder manager um, this year at, in the community service class. So she's doing all of her service learning for the bird feeder. And she's been absolutely amazing. The Bird Feeder is a student-run um, food shelf for students at the high school. And we came up with the idea of doing the, the, the food shelf um, through a fundraiser that I went to um, for my, my personal kids at Spring Lake Park High School. And they were, they were raising money for students to have these weekend backpacks at school for students to take home with them for the weekend. And this year, Jenna has kind of forefronted this idea and kind of organizing and preparing and um, informing students in our class on how we are going to make this work for our St. Louis Park High School. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we did a lot of research and we talked with the, like the um, lunch ladies and we figured out that every one in three students is on free and reduced lunch, meaning that they cannot afford lunch every day at school. So we decided, oh, well, these kids probably don't have enough food over the weekend as well. And we actually have had like a pretty good, decent turnout. Um, over winter break, we packed 90 bags of food for students, and that was over 30 families. And then just over the spring break, we packed 36 bags, which actually fed a decent amount of families. And these bags are not just like, oh, like wimpy little bags. These are like overflowing with amounts <laughs> of food. Um, so yeah, I mainly run the whole thing in general. I work on this Monday through Friday, and then I do a lot of weekend things for like fundraising and just reaching out to the community. And then our community service class works on this Monday and Fridays. And we pack bags, we organize the food. Um, yeah, reach out to other students. Update our social media sites. Yeah. Um, that's one thing with this, it's like running a small business and the students have done a great job updating the sites, answering emails, answering questions on Facebook, um, keeping track of our hits on our website. I know the last time they did like a big food drive, we went out to the community and they put bags on all the community's um, doorsteps and we watched the numbers spike on our um, website of once those bags were delivered, they were like, oh, what's the bird feeder? I'm gonna go check it out online. And we saw like a huge spike in the number of hits that we actually received on the website. So we know student that, so that we know the community is interested in figuring out who we are and what we're about. Yeah. And we receive a lot of support from the staff as well. We have teachers who are willing to over break um, deliver the food actually to the students' houses because they are not able to carry it with them on the bus or just have a lack of transportation in general. So that's a huge thing to see the teachers like willing to help. And same thing with the students. The students are really willing to like get involved and donate food and just support their classmates. Twice a week, the class goes down and checks our drop box at the um, district office as well as the high school student office and the media center. And it always so shocks us every week that the baskets are full of food for us to bring up to our food mm -hmm. shelf to deliver to students. So we want to thank the district office, the student office, and the media center for helping us out with that and the community for putting the food in there. Mm -hmm. And so far, we've had over 5,000 items of food donated, which is a huge success. Our so far right now our shelves are stocked and we have plenty of food to give out to these students in need. 
And what's really nice is organizations, different churches have been donating gift cards. Mm -hmm. And so on these long winter breaks and spring breaks, we're able not only to give food, but also the gift cards from Cub Foods and Target mm -hmm. and other places like Trader Joe's for families to go and shop for things that they don't get from us. Mm -hmm. And as well as I also, as part of the bird feeder, I reach out to other programs within St. Louis Park that are focused towards teens. So like Teens Alone and those other like STEP and those who just provide services to teens in St. Louis Park. So we're kind of getting the full picture and making sure all of their needs, their needs are met and not just being like food here and there. Yeah. So we've sat on boards with STEP, Perspective, Teens Alone, mm -hmm. um, and different homeless shelters for teens to kind of figure out how we could all work together to solve this problem of youth hunger. Mm -hmm. And so far, we've had a couple families get back to us. It's all anonymous, so we have no idea who these students are. Um, they just fill out a form in the counseling office, and then we go off of that form. So it asks, like, how many people in your family? Do you have transportation? Like, are you willing to take paper bags? Um, do you have any special needs or allergies? And what can you cook with? Because we can't give them certain foods if they don't have a microwave, per se. So our request form is constantly changing, even questions like, do you need a can opener? So Jenna has gone out with some of those gift cards that we've received and purchased can openers for families. So it's been a learning experience and mm -hmm. we're so surprised by all of the stories that people share with us um, from the, from the um, caseworkers, social workers, counselors of the high need for food in our community. And it's just mm -hmm. been an eye-opening experience for both Jenna and I, and I believe everybody in our community service class. Yeah. And we've received thank you letters from the actual families who receive our backpacks saying like this is a huge help, like they're going through a hard time and this is really what they needed in this school. So if you want to get involved, you can check us out at uh, the slpbirdfeeder.weebly.com. Um, otherwise, you can just send me an email, ross.sophia at slpschools.org, and um, we'll answer any questions and let you know how you can get involved. Or if you need assistance, um, please contact us. Um, there's a request form online as well that can be printed out or picked up at the counseling office to request food. Thank you, you, everybody, for your support. Can you give us the website again, and, and are there any particular foods that are have a higher need, or does it not matter? Yeah, actually, currently, fruits and vegetables, canned fruits and vegetables, are huge because those are packed in every single backpack for every single meal. So those are in huge demand, especially just because fruits and vegetables are more expensive than the rest of the food you may buy yeah. as a family. So for those families to be able to afford and go out and buy those foods, it's a lot more difficult. I think that was an eye-opener for Jenna. She went mm -hmm. to, was it Sam's Club? Yeah. And she was shopping for fruit, and she's like, oh my gosh, this is so expensive. How am I going to get everything for everybody? So I think that right there is an mm -hmm. eye-opener, just how expensive food yeah. is now. So, yeah. The website, to answer your question, is the SLP bird feeder at Weebly, which no, is dot Weebly, dot Weebly W E E B L Y dot com. So the SLP bird feeder dot weebly dot com. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you so much for taking the time to come down and really telling us this is just a great um, project and I'm hoping it will continue and you'll get a successor plan and because the students will be here, the need will be here great. and uh, generosity is very much appreciated. So. Jenna, right? Yep. Sophia? Yes. Thank, Thank you, you so, so, much. so much. Thank you. Thank you. Nancy, yep. before you let Jenna go, could you also ask her to come back to the mic? I saw a letter jacket with a 14 on it, and I have two questions. One, where is she going to school next year? And the other, can she introduce her parents? Okay, well, um, I actually haven't made my college decision yet. I'm debating between St. Kate's and St. Paul and the UW La Crosse. So, so yeah, mom, dad. <laughs> this is my mom, Sandy, <laughs> and my father, Jeff.
Thank you again. That was just a wonderful beginning to our meeting, and, and kudos to your parents and, uh, and all the other students and parents and community that helped make this work for everybody. Um, so moving on to our agenda, um, the agenda is as follows. We're going to modify it slightly from what was posted. The first thing on our agenda is going to be a superintendent report. Second, a student international travel request. Third, the summer school programs. Fourth, district construction update. Five, 2004-2015 staffing report. Then we will have our consent agenda, our action agenda. On our action agenda is international travel school band and probationary non-renewals. It is that time of the school year. Um, and then we will have uh, communications and transmittals and adjournment. Do I have a motion to approve that agenda? Move to Moved by Bruce. Is there a second? Second. Second by Karen. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Carries 7 0. So let us start with the superintendent report. Thank you, Nancy. This meeting is taking place on April 7th, and the school district is just returning from spring break. And as we returned from break, we were greeted by some very sad news that one of our students, 12th grader Evan McManus, uh, was backpacking, hiking in the Colorado mountains over break with his father and became lost. As of today, the search continued to try to find Evan and his father, Damien. And I wanted just to take a moment to wish, hope, pray for the best possible outcome for Evan and his family. There's a Facebook page set up where current information is available. It's titled Missing Damien and Evan's Evan McManus. So feel free to go to that Facebook page and keep up with the latest information on the search for Evan and his father. Thank you, Rob. I would also add um, that the district has done work preparing to meet the needs of our students and our community during this um, difficult, uncertainty, uncertain time so that, uh, that people are being supported during this time. So thank you for doing that. You're welcome. Next on our agenda is the Student International Travel Request. Good evening, Chairperson Gores, members of the board, and Superintendent Metz. Um, I'm here with Steve Schmitz tonight, as we know that the orchestra just came back from Paris, and we've taken all kinds of trips this year. Um, it's so beneficial for our students to have these opportunities to be able to travel the world and, and um, just experience things that you can't read in a book. So I promote books. But travel is amazing. And Steve is here to ask permission or approval for um, some more international travel for the, for the band at the high school. Thank you, Ms. Karatoff, board, Superintendent Metz. If you think back to your high school days, if you were involved in an athletic or musical team, perhaps your more, most vivid memories like mine were of uh, trips and travel. And so I'm asking for your blessing to go to Puerto Rico which actually is not international. It seems like it is, but it is U.S. soil. Your cell phone will work the same as it does in Iowa. It is, it is U.S. soil. Um, so that gives a lot of people ease that we are in the United States. Um, March 26th to April 1st, so that's um, 2015, estimated 35 to 40 students, five to six chaperones, an administrator, myself, and a professional tour guide that we've used for band choir and orchestra for the last several years. Um, I've personally been there myself two times, just got back a few days ago, and scouted out every single site for safety and educational value for the students. How did this evolve? Uh, last year, the interest for international trips started growing as orchestra was starting to go make plans for London and Paris. The band had never traveled this far, and the band has grown in numbers and quality, and we felt that we should be able to do the same. Not international, per se, but uh, pretty far. It is not my intention for us to reach this precipice where we always need to travel in such a big thing because it is expensive. But just for, for the near future, this is what we're asking. Um, so just to briefly go through the process so you know that it was well covered, we had a weekend 
um, not weekend, the week of Halloween rather, we had a parent meeting and we had a PowerPoint with a detailed itinerary and cost information for Honolulu, Puerto Rico, Costa Rica, and Vancouver. Puerto Rico was the second cheapest trip and it was the winning um, vote getter. Every student in band had a vote and every family had a vote. 110 votes came in, 46% were for Puerto Rico with 20s and 10% range for the other ones. Puerto Rico cost between $1,900 and $2,100 based on diesel and airfare costs, which of course are always up in the air, so to speak. Um, benefits of this particular location, 60% of my band students are in advanced Spanish classes due to PSI and just being in advanced Spanish classes, even if they were not PSI, so they can use their language skills. It's an ecological education there, mountain, beach, desert, and ocean uh, biospheres. Afro-Caribbean Afro music is a huge part of their culture, which I've experienced twice myself and know as a music educator, and it leads to most of the music that we listen to today. Rap, hip-hop, rock, country, all evolve from Afro-Cuban. Um, finally, we would have public performance for the people of Puerto Rico, and we'd have a clinic with the University of San Juan clinician, professor. Um, in terms of money, because that's always a concern, we've had many group fundraisers to take, the goal for myself is to take 200 to $400 off of the cost for every single child, no matter their financial need. We've had, we're about to have a mattress fundraiser, uh, there's been a bowling fundraiser in silent auction, there's a pancake breakfast coming up, there's hot dog stands at Rainbow and Cub, we've been very busy. Uh, there's also um, hoping to get scholarships of $500 for kids in need, several, besides $200 to $300 off for everyone. There's also a chance for individual scholarships, selling cookie dough, Mother's Day flowers coming up, and band discount cards. As for safety, um, one thing that I just want to put out there is that I do realize that the drinking age is 18 there instead of 21. Uh, I've done my homework. However, there is no drinking age in Europe and there were no problems. And so <laughs> that was just fine. We'll just keep our policies the same as we do. Um, as I said, I've been there twice and take this very seriously, requesting and speaking to you. We'll hire a security guard from 11 to 3 a.m. like we do for all of our trips to make sure they are secure and in their hotel rooms and chaperones are well trained. Um, we'll also hire a lifeguard if there are any, um, any swimming outings. That's all I have, just asking for your blessing on that and thank you for your time. I got it. I got Two, two questions, or two, one comment and a question. Having been to Puerto Great. Rico and loved it, the rainforest there was the best I've ever been in. So I don't know if it's on your itinerary, but I would Absolutely. say Absolutely. loved it. And we have to ask, what's a mattress fundraiser? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it took a while to sell me too, but, um, but I'm sold. The band parents are sold, and now everyone's sold. So we're selling new, um, new brand name mattresses at 20 to 60% off. You'll hear more about it. You'll see sounds or signs around town. If you buy it through the band, you can help us. So, uh, in the cafeteria, yeah, April nineteenth. So, okay, I'll ask the last one then, since Jim Jim typically asks about insurance. So, I just want to make sure that our insurance covers this trip with students. Does it? Um, we had an insurance policy with Miss Salen when I went to San Francisco, and I don't know I don't know the amount, but I believe it's covered. Yes, under a school-sponsored event like this, it is covered under our insurance. Thank you so much. I have one question. The yep. pancake breakfast, is that going to be on site here, or is it at a different restaurant or something? Um, Nelson's, which is a meat, um, I believe a meat store in town new. I'm, I'm friends with the, um, not friends, acquaintances, I should say, with the father and the son, the family, and they're willing to put on a free pancake breakfast for us just to kind of show goodwill toward the community and help the band out. So it'd probably be at Nelson's. Yeah. I just want to say this seems very well planned and a good model for future presentations to us because we do ask similar questions and we always seem to support um, you know the the opportunity for the cultural experience and being at the same time being concerned about finances and that kids who don't have that sitting in a bank account can come and you've just addressed all those issues so thank you great thank you thank you very much we'll take this up when we get to the action agenda later thank you thank you you don't, you don't need to stay for that you'll you'll hear all about it <laughs> thanks take care. And then uh, next on our agenda is the summer school programs.
Good evening, members of the board, and thank you for letting us come and talk to you about our summer programs. Uh, tonight, uh, Mike Nordine couldn't make it, so I am taking his place. And with me is Carrie Schwedering, who is our 9th through 12th grade summer coordinator, Gina Magnuson, who is our 6th through 8th grade summer coordinator at the middle school, and Charlie McChesney, who is our youth services coordinator in community ed, who will be uh, coordinating summer learning and play. And they'll come up in a couple minutes to talk to you about their specific programs. Uh, first, our summer school mission is to ensure that students graduate on time by providing credit recovery for students in 9th through 12th grade who have failed a class or two, um, and offering skill enhancement to students in grades uh, kindergarten uh, through 8th grade who are at risk of not graduating on time. And the reason we word it that way is because um, it's under, uh, the funding is under alternative learning statute, which is the statute that covers credit recovery, independent study, and targeted services. And under that uh, funding source, we receive, the district receives reimbursement based on seat time or learning time. Uh, students must meet certain graduation incentive criteria, and every student must have a continual learning plan in place. Our learners are uh, a cross-section of at-risk learners, and they cannot be dominated by one category. And uh, there are many graduation incentive criteria, but the ones we focus on are limited English proficiency, special education, one year or more behind in coursework, or not meeting uh, proficiency on NWEA or MCA tests, and then, of course, the students who have failed a class and need credit recovery. Uh, this summer, the dates are July 7th through August 7th, that's five weeks. Uh, Monday through Thursday, K through 8 is 8 a.m. to noon, and 9 through 12 is uh, morning session, 8 to 11, afternoon session, 11.30 to 2.30. And the locations uh, will be the same as last year, Aquila, and I put pre-K through 5, and that's just a little teaser for a slide coming up about what's something we're doing this summer, uh, middle school and uh, the high school. And of course our features, as usual, we have breakfast and snack included at no cost for pre-K through eighth grade, and uh, transportation for, uh, for pre-K through eight students and K through 12 choice students. And so new this year, uh, we have received funding through the Early Learning Pathways Scholarships to run a summer school program. And um, it's for 30, it's an intensive program for 30 students who will be entering kindergarten in the fall who we are, we're in the process of developing a criteria, but who have either had no preschool experience or who are in our programs already, and we determine that they are going to need more intensive work in order to be ready for kindergarten. And uh, we are added it to Aquila for lots of reasons. One is for efficiencies, of course, because we already have a program there, but also it will, uh, it will mimic the type of uh, experience they'll have when they enter school in the fall. So that'll kind of get rid of one like barrier that students have when they enter uh, kindergarten is you know the newness of it. Well, they'll have been with um, children who are older than them. They will have ridden the bus. They will have done all those kinds of things. Like I said, it's for 30 students, um, and we'll have two classrooms. Uh, very intense in that we're going to have one teacher and two assistants in each classroom and plus volunteers. So they'll get lots of um, one-on-one -on -one time and small group time and that kind of thing. So right now we're in the process of putting together a curriculum and we're going to hire the teachers and um, things like that. So we're real excited about that program. And of course there will be construction at Aquila this summer. And um, so uh, because of that, our extended school year or ESY program is moving to the high school just for this summer. And um, it might have, we might have to figure out some things to do with our breakfast program because we're not sure if they're going to be able to use the cafeteria or the, uh, the kitchen and things like that. So now I'm going to turn it over to Carrie Schwedering. She's going to talk about high school. Thank you, Lisa. Um, at the high school, this is looking at last year. 
Um, the high school runs a little different than the middle school or elementary. Um, at middle school and elementary, we want students there. Um, we want to recruit kids to be there. It's not that we don't want them at the high school, but what that does mean is that they've failed a class. So if our enrollment actually in summer school goes down, that's a good thing because that means kids are actually earning the credits they should be throughout the year. We've also, a couple of years back, have um, introduced Play-Doh, which is an online credit recovery that students now have that option throughout the year um, for specific groups of students to earn that credit quickly rather than waiting an entire year and then only having the summer option. So um, because of that, our numbers have fluctuated a little bit. But um, looking at last year, we had 120 students attend all the required hours. So again, um, differently about how funding works is that um, for a student to earn the credit, they have to um, actually be in attendance and actually be at class um, a certain required amount of hours. So they have to have made it to all of their classes. Um, and then we looked at how many credits were attempted. We had 168 total credits attempted. So we had, you know, obviously some of the students were taking more than one credit um, that they needed to make up. And 63 of those were through Play-Doh. Um, that's our online option. Um, out of those 168, 154 credits were actually earned. And so that's a huge success for us because these are students who obviously historically have not been successful in that class, which is why they're here. So um, I give that credit to our great staff that we have um, and just the dedication of making it a different thing, not just repeating what they didn't get the first time, really trying to um, reach the needs of our um, students. And then one thing we did different last year is we, for the first time, offered an elective art class. And um, there's some beautiful mural down, actually, that has our, has our Oreo code, and it's on the first floor circle. But it was an opportunity for students who normally wouldn't be um, attending summer school, but wanted an option to try something a little different, build, um, you know, beautify our school, but also build community. And um, so we had uh, an art teacher um, who was actually a community member um, asked if she could do this and helped create this and, and worked with us to do it. And so that was a, a neat opportunity that we were able to do last year. The other thing that's always kind of a highlight, not kind of, very much a highlight at summer school is that the, the seniors who potentially did not um, earn their diploma. They may have walked, but they needed another credit because of you know whatever reason may be. And so um, that we had five um, diplomas earned over um, last summer school, last summer. So that's just always a great um, time that you know, the, the students are still very invested, and even though it's a month after they walked across that stage, that they're still working at it and making sure that they get that paper in their hand and off they go. So, um, so yes, we're looking forward to the high school program again this summer. And I will let Gina talk about the middle school. Thank you, Carrie. So at the middle school, we are dealing with a different beast, a great beast, but they are fun. We um, struggle a little bit trying to get people to uh, commit because of the either they're helping to care for children uh, or their siblings, or they don't have to have child care anymore and they can be on their own, so that's kind of a battle. But we, uh, good news is that we're continuing to increase our numbers every single year. And as you can see, we actually maintained our numbers all for the all five weeks. Uh, my first year we kind of dropped off a little bit and we've been able to maintain them with great staff and curriculum and helping uh, give them the importance of why they're there so we can close those skill gaps. A big thing that we try to do to keep them there is we do a mountain bike giveaway. I work with a nonprofit organization um, that has gently used bikes and I get six of them every single year and every day you are in attendance your name goes into a drawing and at the end of the last day of school you get uh, your name gets picked and you there's three female bikes and three male bikes so it's two per grade level a male winner and a female winner and this year we also get helmets that are coming with them though those are brand new so that's always a big highlight and now they're old enough that they can either ride away with them or their parents come pick them up and they have a mode of transportation um, when summer school is over so that's usually a big highlight for us is that the mountain bike, mountain bike giveaway to keep kids coming every day um, Lisa had talked about the breakfast and snack. Last year was the first year at the middle school that we were able to provide a hot and cold choice breakfast and then a free snack as well. And that will continue again this year. And then another highlight coming into this year is that we will have um, actual curriculum to help uh, close the skill gap um, that Carrie Ross and Lisa helped us get called Stars and Cars. So that's exciting. Um, thank you. And Mike's not here, so Lisa's going to fill in for him. 
Muchas yes. gracias. Uh, when I saw those attendance numbers, I about fell over. Uh, bribery works. It I does. Think, I think that is just a wonderful way to get it done, and that, that is so inventive. It's brilliant. Thank you. Well, thank you. And uh, for the elementary program, there are, uh, there are the attendance numbers from last year. And you can see there was a bit of a fall off. And it's kind of hard to say. A lot of times it's family issues and things like that. At the elementary level, obviously, a first grader doesn't make a decision whether they're going to go to school or not. So there, sometimes there's parent or family issues that cause uh, attrition in a summer school program. And uh, we, uh, at the elementary level as well, uh, are investing in a new curriculum and training uh, for reading instruction with uh, Carrie Ross's help. And I think the teachers are going to be really excited about that because, you know, as much as our teachers are very creative and they like to come in um, and, you know, do their thing in the summer is a really good time for them to be able to kind of try some new things, still four hours is a lot of time to fill. And if they can get at least one part of the core curriculum, kind of established and they know what they're going to be doing, they can work their creativity all the way around that. So, and it also provides um, like, uh, you know, the this, this same type of thing for all of our students, a consistency for all of our students. So, uh, so we are excited uh, for the uh, curriculum that we'll be getting this summer. And now I'm going to turn it over to Charlie McChesney. All right, thanks, Lisa. Um, I wanted to start by apologizing for being a little underdressed. I ran directly from baseball practice, so if my hair doesn't look good on TV, <laughs> it's uh, because I just took my hat off, so my apologies. Um, I'm gonna just speak briefly about um, <clears throat> summer learning and play, um, which may be new to a number of you. Um, that being because we actually changed the name. Last year it was Summer Spark. There was some confusion between our program and the grant at the elementary schools, so we went back to summer learning and play, which was the original name. Um, our program this year, it's a fee-based uh, enrichment camps in the summer. We run this year from June 16th to August 7th. Um, just a couple highlights. Um, this is the highest number of offerings we've had this year since I started uh, three years ago, which is great. We also have the highest number of district employees um, teaching these camps and classes, which I also um, am very excited about. Um, it, it's very helpful with our numbers. Our staff, there are, they are their best promoters, so we're seeing a lot more students um, coming from their classes and their schools, which is great. Um, <clears throat> we're already underway with registration. Uh, as of this morning, uh, we were just shy of 200 in re individual enrollments, which is great for this time of year for us. Um, the second piece that I wanted to talk about is the bridge to summer school. In the, you'll see in your catalog, there's a pink sheet that, that uh, talks briefly about that. And I apologize for the small font. I wanted to make sure it fit on uh, one page. Um, the Bridge to Summer School is our partnership with the Summer Learning Academy that allows students enrolled in their program to participate in up to three of our camps for free uh, during the first three weeks of classes. So we actually doubled the number of offerings this year that are available for those students. And because of Independence Day falling on a Friday, we were able to offer that program for three weeks as opposed to two, which we have done in the last few years, which is which is great. Um, yeah, I think that's all I had, unless there's any questions. Any questions for anybody? I can't remember now. It's either the first or second year when we decided to go later in the summer as opposed to earlier. And I'm wondering what, we're doing it again, so I assume we're finding out that it's worked pretty well. But I remember there was the kind of the balance of catching the students right after they get out of school. They're still kind of in school versus the drop off that you have if it ends by 4th of July to school? And what, what are we learning? Well, I think uh, that was uh, my first summer working it. That was 2011 when we made that change. And uh, that's why we put in the bridge to summer school with uh, summer learning and play, or now called summer learning and play, in order so kids don't like find other things to do before uh, summer learning academy starts. And uh, we think it's been successful that uh, the kids who have signed up and then have gone to summer learning and play um, have then 
continued on to go to our summer school program. So I think that's been successful and we've not experienced that drop off that we might have had we not had that bridge to summer school in place. Does that answer your question or? In part, so <clears throat> the bridge is helping keep the kids going. Uh, and I assume, I don't know what percentage of them are, are doing that, but I know the trade off was so we're not losing as many, but then the question is, is it helping our scores then in the fall by having them go you know, that's, later? Yeah. That's a good question, and I don't know that we that we have, now we haven't tracked that or have data on that, but I think um, moving forward, uh, starting maybe in summer of 2015, I know Carrie's on board now and she's already starting to help us with getting curriculum and things like that. So I think the next step is going to be to start tracking that. One of the things that I have learned um, you know, from talking to people who do uh, assessment is that, you know, it's it's kind of hard to tell with only a five week program, but uh, if we can figure that out with Prachi and things like that, I think that would be a, a good use of our time to start looking at that and seeing if it is making a difference. Of course, we don't have the data that from before that's, you know, that what it was before. So, um, but data that's out there just in general, does say that the closer you can get your summer programming to the school year, the next school year, the better it is. Is, it, is that what you find too, Kate? Yeah, okay. A piece of that would be um, if you're able to identify all those kids that are taking that summer school classes, you already have their scores from the previous year, check their scores after that, that next year and see if you have progress in that. And then you could, you could, you could uh, put some numbers to that and certainly that. we could see that if they um, right if and see if they're if they've not lost learning over the summer if they're kind of back on track if they've even made some gains and that kind of thing from previous year yeah um, I just <clears throat> excuse me as you were going through this I was flashing back to some conversations from teachers from previous summer school sessions and the continual learning plans I remember hearing was an important factor if they really had, because they're teaching students that they don't necessarily know from the school year, that that was an important factor in getting to know that student and figuring out what they needed. So um, I'm glad to see that's still there and I just actually, wanted to share that. Oh good, I actually like hearing that because that is a requirement of the funding. So I'm glad that it actually has some other use just besides us having to do it to get the funding. <laughs> How are you doing on recruiting teachers and what's the quality or the experience level of teachers that we tend to get for our summer school programs? Do we, is there a recruiting time? Do you, you know? Uh, I'm gonna turn this over to Because that's always critical, what's happening with the teacher in the classroom. You know, Absolutely. We have more intentional curriculum now, which is good. Now, how are we doing on the mm -hmm. teacher front? I don't want to speak for all of us, but I know um, Gina and Mike and I have had conversations about that and how important it is. Um, and you know, Charlie had mentioned it as well, that when we can have in-house people, that's just so crucial. Um, it makes a difference. I've had teachers who have taught civics who are fabulous teachers who come from other districts and um, are drawn to our di district for a lot of great reasons and so they want the opportunity. Um, but it's a different learning curve um, of what it is that we teach in our civics, what does that look like, um, versus a, a staff member that I have here that has a key to the room that can get to the materials, that knows where they left off, that knows who their teacher was that they didn't pass with, that kind of a thing. So um, I feel like we've done a really good job um, the three of us throughout the last few years of keeping staff that we've had um, as well as being able to if we have to pull in more numbers and I know Mike has a more of an issue with the number of staff that he has to have um, with not being able to always get everybody in-house but then those that he is not able to have really um, coaching and help setting them up with a mentoring um, kind of system to help um, ensure that we're having great quality and you know, I, I feel really strongly, and I can speak specific to the high school, that we do have high, high quality teachers. And, um, you know, it's been, it makes a difference. It really does. If, if I were a teacher, I think I would like that three week break and then starting fresh again um, the way we're starting a little bit later. So I don't know if you're seeing that that makes a difference in recruiting, but I would, I would suspect it might. Do you see a difference there? Yeah, I would agree with you that by the end of the year, we all kind of need a break. And so that def that three-week break definitely is crucial. And then also, it's kind of 
right in the middle of that summer and then you also have a two week break before you go back. So I guess it can be a win-win situation for staffing. Thank you. Anybody else? Thank you for coming in and letting us know where the, how the planning is going. It sounds like a great, great um, opportunity for our students and I know you'll be working uh, around the construction which we're going to hear about momentarily. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And we should say, Charlie, as long as you're wearing Oreo clothes, you're dressed just fine. <laughs> Next on the agenda, we're going to hear about the district construction update. This will be Sandy Celine and Paul Aplikowski from Wold Architects. Well, as we know, we uh, passed a bond referendum last fall, and as part of that bond referendum, we have decided to do some additions at three of our elementaries, Aquila, Susan Lindgren, and Peter Hobart. Um, Paul Aplikowski is a part of Wold Construction or Wold Architects that's helping us with this process of, of design stage as well as planning stages on, on how to get these projects done. So with that, I'm going to leave it up to our expert, Paul Aplikowski, who will give you an update on where the designs are as well as a timeline and what to expect for these next few months. Do you want to put that up for me? So oh, sure. I'll free that on. Good evening. Um, I'm just going to real quick run through the designs and where they've evolved to as we've gone and talk a little bit about the schedule and then we can answer any questions you have. Um, so Sandy's putting up on the screen the schedule. I think maybe you've seen that before. It hasn't really changed. Um, the point that we're at in the timeline right now is we've, uh, we needed to get the site designs up to a certain point and submit those to the city for approval for their site plan review. And so that was submitted on St. Patrick's Day. And uh, it's a couple month process to get through all that. Uh, so we're really timing out that for when we issue the drawings so that uh, we'll be bidding basically right after the city council approval if all goes well there. So we're trying to tighten that timeline up. Um, so we're on track there. I will say, I know there's a lot of expectation about these additions happening. It will be a while before construction starts. So. Don't expect that the day after school things are necessarily all moving. Um, some of that might be going on because hopefully you'll have contractors on board, but um, it'll probably be midsummer before you see things really in swing out there, and construction will continue into the fall as planned. So, um, I'll quick run through the designs a little bit. Um, we'll be following along on the boards here, and I don't know, will those appear up here or they're on the boards here? I don't know if they can get those on the camera for the, for the TV, but. Um, we'll start with Peter Hobart. Um, there shouldn't be any big surprises for anybody here in the overall plan that we've got. We did a lot of this sort of master planning for this, not, not only during the referendum, but as we did the addition last fall, we kind of master planned for this. So we had a lot of things figured out here. Um, I will say that with all of the projects, there's been little unique challenges that have happened. So in this case, the cafeteria um, is, is more of a construction challenge than we thought, but we think we have it all under control. Um, the cafeteria addition is going to over double. It's about two and a half times the seating that, the, that it has now, which is going to be a great addition to the school. The classroom addition um, is just a mirror of the one that you've seen that was just built. Um, and then the kindergarten addition is um, per the request of the users there and the, the staff there is to be much similar to the other kindergarten rooms. So no real surprises there. Um, I should mention that with each of the sites we've had um, a handful of meetings now with a, kind of a, a group of stakeholders from the site and we talked about the scope of the projects with each of them. In addition to that, we've met with the administration in each building, we've met with the district administration and then also individual meetings with teachers on spaces that they are going to be in. Um, so we've got a lot of input going for these projects. Moving over to Aquila, um, again, the plan should look an awful, awfully familiar too. There's not a lot of changes. I will point out that as we did this and as we talked with the group there, we did look at all new options. So where we've landed the addition is um, what was anticipated in the referendum. We did look at other options for putting it um, on another part of the building, but it turned out that that really is the best spot for it. Um, the addition includes um, three regular classrooms and then a third third classroom that can be divided into two. So that classroom um, labeled C on the plan is about a thousand square foot room that can be divided into two 500 square foot rooms to give you some flexibility. So um, it's anticipated that when you move in, those will be special ed rooms, but it will have some flexibility for the future. 
Uh, another thing we were able to accomplish with the Aquila project is we've built in a little bit of what we labeled flex learning space there on the plan. Um, those that space um, in a, in Aquila they have very uh, I should I should say less sort of free learning space than the other ones. So the other they have a much smaller media center, and we really felt that trying to get a little bit of that in there would be beneficial for them. Um, it's not a lot, but it gives them a little bit of extra breakout space for this new part of the building. Um, at both Aquila and as I talk about Susan Lingren, there was a request to improve bathrooms at those buildings. Um, those weren't things that we anticipated in the scope prior to this. Um, and it's our intent working with the administration. We're going to bid those out as alternates and see how the bids come in. And you can make a decision later on whether or not you award those. Are you talking new bathrooms or improving existing? In Aquila's case, what we're talking about is renovating the ones that are across the hall from the new addition. Um, we're hopeful that we could get one, probably one more fixture in each of those. So it's not a dramatic improvement, but it will certainly update them. Um, the Aquilas are pretty tired looking. Um, and get a little bit more functionality out of them. Then moving over to Susan Lindgren, um, this one does look a lot different than, uh, than it was when we started. I think it's a better project for it. Um, this is largely due to the input of that site team that we met with. Um, as we talked about the functions um, that go on in that building and how well it works now, we really felt that retasking the project would be in order. Uh, so. Reviewing the plans, you can see on the upper level, we're showing in area C there some renovation of the existing office, and that's in lieu of what we were going to do downstairs. What we're going to do, though, is probably make a better security solution than we were going to have before. Um, it's a very unique building with the entries on the top and the bottom level, and we think that this will fit better with how they function. So what we're doing is taking out um, the corner of the office where the conference room is now. That's going to become a new vestibule coming into the building, which will allow you to lock down the building and force people into that office to get screening, which we think will be a great improvement. Um, the rest of the things that we're doing in the office are only to make to re replace functionality from doing that. Um, so we're shifting around the workroom and some interior renovation in there to create that conference room over, over again. And again, I, I think that we're going to end up with a better, more functional conference room than they have now. It's just a little bit bigger um, and, and also preserve all the workroom functions. So I think that's a success story there. Um, the addition um, then switched from being that office downstairs to being classrooms. And again, this is at the the suggestion of that site council. After looking at it, we think it's a great idea. So what you're seeing is um, a classroom, a two-story addition added. One of them will plug into the middle level on the west end of the building. Um, and you can see that's here labeled as, where is that one? I'm sorry. That, that's the one at the top of the page there. Uh, that one will be a regular 900 square foot classroom about the size of any of your other grade level classrooms. In order to make this meet code, we have to create a hallway there that goes out. And so you can see that shown in the plan there. And then down at the bottom of the page, you'll see on the upper level, what we're doing is we're creating a kindergarten room. We're able to make that a little bit bigger because it, it goes over that hallway that's there. Um, that will include a, a toilet room within the classroom, as is desirable for kindergarten rooms. and a, overall creates a little bit bigger, about a 1,200, little under 1,200 square foot space. There are, um, there's a little bonus space up there coming out to the kindergarten room. Um, it's pretty small and it needs to be used for circulation, but again, we think it provides a little bit of opportunity for breaking out of the classroom and working with people. Uh, the projects, as I said, we've hit a number of challenges. Uh, we anticipate that you'll have to dip into the referendum contingencies just a little bit to make these work. Um, some of the challenges were things like, um, as we looked at Aquila uh, and how to do that addition, we really feel it's best to rip the roof off there, which is going to let us get some better ceiling height, but a little bit more cost for that. Again, we think you can fit all that in your budget. And Susan Lindgren, um, we did hit some surprises as we moved to that side of the building. That's not the best soils over there. So we're going to have to do some special foundations to make that happen. But again, we think all of that can be absorbed within the contingencies planned for the budgets. So. Any questions? Can you just review the time frame one more time for us, Paul? Sure. Um, as I said, we're um, we're in city approval processes right now. We are actively working on finishing up the documents and getting them ready for bidding. Um, so we'll be issuing in uh, about two or three weeks, something like that, to be timed to receive bids shortly after the city council meeting. 
um, then that will take um, some time for you to approve projects and for the contractors to get ramped up, do shop drawings, all those. We anticipate probably you'll see most activity starting around July, the beginning of July in the summer. Um, and then it will take several months to get that done. Um, we don't want to make any promises that can't be delivered. So we're suggesting you plan on January 1st. There may be some chance they'll finish up a little earlier, but that's the plan. So July to basically January will be construction. Great. Thank you very much. Appreciate the update. Thank you. Next up, we have the staffing report, probationary non-renewal placements. And uh, we're scheduled to hear this from the Director of Human Resources, Kimberly Hergott, but I see that she's not here. So who? I can fill in. Rob, thank you. Uh, tonight we have in our action agenda our <laughs> list of uh, non-renewals expiration of contracts and leave of absences that we're asking the board to approve. I can say from uh, past experience, even though there are some names on this list, it is, is not a long list by some of our past experiences. Good news is we are really not making any budget cuts this year, uh, any real budget cuts. So the, the names that you see on this list are people who in some cases are there because grants that were funding their positions are going away. In other cases, they are a result of shifting in some assignments. In others, they are non-renewals that are suggested by the principal or the administrator in charge. There's also a list of a uh, couple of people who work from year to year on separate contracts that are being, uh, that are expiring. And, and then we have some leave requests that we are approving for a variety of reasons. Some of the people on this list will be returning to positions in the district uh, similar to the ones they held or slightly different. So all in all, uh, even though this is a difficult task and a difficult process to go through, this is a, a good situation for us as we're not making any real budget cuts this year. Thank you. Any questions? I don't, excuse me, I do not have a voice tonight, at least not when I first opened my mouth. Um, I would propose, if we don't have any further questions now, um, normally this resolution requires uh, reading through the entire uh, resolution and everybody's name at least twice in here. Um, one thing we've done in the past is to uh, waive the reading of the resolution, and so I would begin by making a motion to waive the reading of the resolution. And Julie, we're not quite to the action agenda, but maybe when we get there, I'll we'll do that back. later. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were setting the stage. Oh, well, I, I, I think I did. <laughs> Go ahead. What else is there, Cindy? Can I, just, can I just make sure that the board is looking at the revised consent agenda that I put in front of you? There were a few corrections since the agenda was posted on Friday. Right, and that is the next part of the agenda. Rob just discussed where, where we are on the staffing report. And next on our agenda is the consent agenda. And in front of us when we took our seats was a new pink sheet. The resolution is different as well. Yes. Um, so let, let's uh, deal with the consent agenda first, since that's how our agenda is written. Is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Moved by Jim, seconded by Karen. Um, any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? <coughs> Carries, 7 0. And then next, we are to the action agenda. And the first thing on our action agenda is the International Travel High School Band. It is recommended that the school board approve the international travel for the high school band program in spring 2015. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. So it was moved by Jim, seconded by Julie. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstain? Carries 7-0. Now, we are up to the probationary non-renewals. All right, now I would move uh, to waive the reading of the resolution related to the non-renewals of the teaching contracts. It's been moved by Julie, is there a second? I would second that. Seconded by Ken, any discussion? All in favor? 
Aye. Opposed? Abstain? Carries 7 0. And now I would move the actual resolution, which we don't need to read then, but we still probably need the roll call vote. And is there a second to Julie's motion recommending that the board approve the resolution recommending 20 probationary teachers uh, be terminated and seconded by Bruce? Any discussion? Okay. Um, would the clerk call the roll call, please? Course. Aye. Tatalovich, aye. Richardson? Aye. Morrison? Aye. Waters? Aye. Schweitzer? Aye. Yarosh? Aye. 7 0 vote. Motion carries 7 0. Next on our agenda, last on our agenda, uh, we are up to communications and transmittals. Do we have any? Wait, was it? Are we going to? So we didn't vote on the waiver of the of the reading. We did. That was. That was. Oh, that was not. Got it. We did both. Uh, we did. All right. The, only only the second one had to be. Uh, yeah. Roll call. It. Yeah. Thank you. Go ahead, Karen. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to just reiterate that our spotlight with the bird feeder tonight really showcased our children first asset number twenty seven equality and social justice. And what's really impressive is Sophia Ross, our teacher, is a great leader, but she lets the kids drive and plan and create and do. And so they get a lot of experience and have a lot of leadership, and that's a really great program. Um, some things coming up Thursday night at 7 p.m. in the gym is the orchestra festival. And then um, we have the spring play starting on the 25th at 7 p.m. It's called Shipwrecked. I think it's going to be quite funny. And then finally, um, High School Career Day is Wednesday, April 29th. And Kara Mueller is still looking for uh, people employed in medical, business, or STEM jobs. And you can contact her at 928-6187 to be part of that career day, which is from 930 to 1045 in the field house on Wednesday the 29th. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to bring up a, an event happening on Thursday, and I thought Karen was going directly toward this by talking about the bird feeder program and then an event on Thursday. But she went to a different event on Thursday, which shows what a great uh, community uh, we have here that so many great things are going on at once. Uh, the event that I'm uh, going to mention on Thursday is the Empty Bowls um, uh, that's run by STEP, the food shelf in town. And I was very pleased to hear uh, Jenna earlier tonight when she was talking about the bird feeder, talking about the partnerships that she has with STEP and the other organizations in town. Because bird feeder can only do so much. Um, the people at STEP and at the other organizations are, are trained at dealing with you know, the entire person, their psychological needs, their job needs. Um, the bird feeder is, is a great um, food shelf for students who are both uh, from St. Louis Park and from Minneapolis or wherever they come from, whereas, whereas STEP uh, treats uh, St. Louis Park uh, individuals. So that's just an aside uh, to uh, the bird feeder program that we heard about earlier tonight. I was very Pleased to hear that. But the Empty Bowls event is at Westwood Lutheran Church here on Thursday, April 10th from 11.30 to 1.30 and also from 4.40 to 6.30. So I hope to see you there. Thank you. I uh, just want to briefly talk about the listening session that we had on March 25th. Karen and I attended. Um, <clears throat> we heard from some of our uh, employee groups, union reps, about uh, the pace of uh, negotiations. And so we, we listened and we've communicated uh, with the superintendent and, you know, we're hopeful now that we got the teacher's contract settled that we can you know, get, uh, get going and uh, hopefully settle those groups as well. Uh, that will be a good thing. 
we also heard from our Sparks counselor uh, who talked about what they've done in the school and uh, that is related to a grant that is expiring. Um, we also uh, heard about sidewalks. It was just a little more depth than what we heard at the prior school board meeting. Um, and also there is a, and I forget all the details offhand, I don't have my notes, but a Fofana family uh, clothing drive that um, f the family of one of the students who passed away last year, Mohammed uh, Fofana, they are, um, through Peter Hobart, are, yeah, they're building this school, school in Africa. Africa. Yeah. yeah. Why did I say Fofana family, so, yeah, well, so they're doing a clothing drive and they did their first batch right before spring break and the idea is the school that's going to be built in Mohammed's memory, the clothing that they bring over is to uh, help the kids attending the school and they're going to have a little shop to sell so they can sustain um, with supplies and tuition and the um, Peter Hobart site council and PTO will get the word out when the next clothing drives will take place the coming school year. They had one right uh, drop of right before spring break and they're gonna get the word out and hopefully this will be something that sustains. So Rob just whispered to me it's a school being built in Africa? Yes. Uh, lately I've been uh, pushing a book and it is on my top five list right now. And it's called The Smartest Kids in the World and How They Got That Way. And it's by Amanda Ripley. And the reason I'm pushing it is because it confirms everything we know in St. Louis Park about education. Uh, our mission says that we will ensure that all students attain the highest level of achievement and become contributing members of society challenging each learner to meet high standards. And that's what this book is all about. Then in our first objective, it says all students will achieve the knowledge, skills, passion, and attitudes to meet or exceed rigorous academic standards without demographically predictable results in order to succeed in their future. And I like our mission, I love our objectives, all of them, uh, but those two points in particular, uh, just this book just points out, and by the way, they take Finland, uh, Korea, and Poland and discuss pros and cons of each of their systems and talk about three kids who went to each of those countries and talked about their experiences there, and one of the kids was from Minnesota. And as Kerry briefed us uh, earlier, uh, Minnesota is, is in its own class. It is a worldwide school, and we're one of the highest rated school, di school systems in the world. So we're, we are in a very good company within the state, uh, but what I like about our mission, it keeps us right at the top of that company. But again, the book is The Smartest Kids in the World and How They Got That Way by Amanda Ripley, and I recommend it most highly. I have two things. One, we have another listening session, uh, and it's the last one that's scheduled. If there's a need for more, we'll, we'll look at that. But um, it's April 26th, Saturday, April 26th. So the other ones have been on a weeknight. This one's gonna be on a weekend, just in case that's more accommodating for some families. Um, it's April, 26th. It's from 10.30 to 12. It's going to be at Central in the PSI Media Center. Um, as always, if nobody uh, shows up within the first half hour, um, whoever's there is going home. So if you're interested in speaking with the board, feel free to um, come. And if you're not, that's okay too. But we'll be there. A couple of us will be there. Uh, uh, our next school board meeting is, is Monday, April 28th. That's a different, that might be a slightly different schedule um, uh, this month, so I just wanted to remind people that that's the next time we'll be here for a regular school board meeting. And then the last um, thing I want to talk about is Anita Silbert, is it Dykel? Yes. Anita, um, Anita, if you came to our high school at any time over a 30 year period, Anita was the one who would be our greeter at the front door. And I'm gonna ask Rob to talk a little bit more about Anita because he was principal during that time. But, but she passed away recently and um, 
I heard a quote once that said, death is not the end of the story. And Anita has touched more students here than probably any of us in this room. And so I just want to give her a special tribute and let Rob talk a little bit about her. Well, I'm proud to talk about Anita. Some of you probably know Anita better than I do. I worked at the high school for six years, and she was there for some of those six years. I was there as she ended up her employment in St. Louis Park. She was, uh, I told the newspaper, the soul of the school. I would describe her that way. She worked the front door during the time when security wasn't as critical as it is now. And she was a great greeter for all the students who came to school every morning and the parents who came to visit. And, and again, as they left at the end of the day, she was famous for giving students and adults kisses on their birthday and having the brightest red lipstick ever and chasing after you and giving you a big kiss on your cheek. I talked to her son last week. Uh, I met him uh, when I was the principal at Aquila because his three children, three of Anita's grandchildren, Miles, Jimmy, and Sarah Silbert, went through Aquila and then the high school when I was here. And he told me some stories that I cannot repeat on TV about <laughs> things that happened when she was working here over those decades. But she was a legend, and I... I want to put in a plug for Bob Laney, former assistant superintendent, former high school principal. I got a chance to watch Bob working with Anita in her last few years at the high school. And I thought he had a great relationship with her, did a masterful job of helping her along and helping those last few years of work for her well into her 80s be good, successful years. So uh, Anita Silver, one of a kind. <laughs> Thank you, and we thank Anita, and we treasure her memory. So, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Is second? Moved and seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. We're adjourned. 7-0. Thank you.